Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. We are now moving on to chapter 11, which will talk about geology, soil, and mineral resources. Uh, a lot of this uh, chapter is actually a, a review of earth science. Uh, so you'll kind of uh, bring back some memories. Uh, most of you, I believe, took it in, 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 in eighth grade. Uh, so there'll be some uh, memories of earth science in this chapter, uh, amongst some other things as well. So uh, we are back to uh, about 60 or so slides. So uh, unlike last chapter, uh, this will be, uh, or two chapters, chapters ago, this will be um, only uh, two parts to this. All right. So part one and part two uh, and part one is beginning right now. So uh, the uh, chapter starts off with a core case study about the real cost of gold. Um, there are a lot of harmful effects of gold mining out there. So uh, you have massive amounts of rock that are dug up to yield only a small amount of gold. All right. So think about that. A little bit of gold comes out of all that rock uh, and you have to obviously, uh, uh, you know, extract all that rock uh, to get to the gold. In addition, there's highly toxic cyanide salts that are used to actually extract the gold uh, into settling ponds. So this actually pulls the gold out of the rock that it's in, uh, puts it in these settling ponds where then the gold can settle down uh, and the miners uh, uh, can, can, uh, can, can, can get to it. Unfortunately, that uh, cyanide salt is highly toxic to birds and mammals. In addition, it, it seeps down through, uh, down through the ground, percolates through the soil, uh, and actually ends up threatening underground drinking water. Water supplies. In addition, these gold mines can collapse. So for instance, in 2000 in Romania, uh, a gold mine did collapse uh, and it contaminated many rivers uh, with that uh, cyanide uh, and those toxic metals. So these are some of the issues uh, that we are going to be talking about in this chapter. Uh, again, we want to mine mineral resources, uh, but obviously uh, we are mining these mineral resources uh, too quickly. Uh, they are, they are non-renewable resources and of course uh, other issues in the mining process uh, leads to environmental uh, de degradation. All right. So um, what are the earth's major geological processes and mineral resources? Well, dynamic processes within the earth and on its surface produce the mineral resources, basically the rock cycle. Okay. That's what we're going to talk about. If you remember back from earth science, sedimentary, metamorphic, igneous rocks, that rock cycle. Well, that's what is producing our mineral resources. Now we consider mineral resources non-renewable again. Why? Because they're produced and renewed over millions of years again by the earth's rock cycle. So again, uh, mineral resources, they are renewed, but they're renewed over millions of years. So similar to fossil fuels like oil, we call them non-renewable because in a, in a general human lifespan, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, renew uh, mineral resources. All right. So again, they are a, a, a non-renewable resource. All right. Geology is the study of the dynamic processes taking place on the Earth's surface and in the interior. And again, just a reminder from back in earth science, there are three major concentric zones of the earth. We have the core, all right, member made up of the inner core and the liquid outer core. We have the mantle, which includes the asthenosphere. And remember, the asthenosphere is what we call the plastic mantle. Remember, it is it is partially melted, uh, the asthenosphere, and, and that's where the plates, remember with plate tectonics, plates float on top of that asthenosphere, and that's how uh, a plate uh, the plates move uh, around the planet over over millions of years. Uh, in addition, we have crust, right? Two types of crust continental crust, uh, which is actually less dense than oceanic crust, which is more dense. And most of the crust, almost three quarters of the crust on the planet is, is oceanic crust, uh, which is more basalt. Uh, continental crust uh, has more granite in it. And we'll talk more about uh, those rock types in, in just a bit. So uh, this is a, uh, a chart here, time scale for major geological and biological changes since the earth formed about four, uh, 4.6 billion years ago. So basically you're going through on the left side here, the era, the Precambrian, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic, all right? They have the periods, all right? Again, this kind of remember back to earth science, all right? Periods are within the era, uh, era and then here we have the time, so that, uh, for instance, the Archaean uh, period of the Precambrian era, 4.6 to 2.5 uh, billion years ago, the Proteozoic era of the of period of the Precambrian era uh, was 2.5 billion years to about uh, 545 million years ago. 
etc etc and then you'll notice major events uh, here on the right side uh, likely origin of, of the first life here uh, again you have your first mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician period here's your second third fourth fifth mass extinction again here was the one that got the dinosaurs the end of the crustaceous and then right now the mass extinction that we believe humans are causing uh, currently happening right now so again just kind of have a general idea of these errors uh, and come some major events that kind of happened in them uh, again you don't need to memorize this entire chart uh, but definitely understand uh, understand what you're looking at here uh, what we're looking at here is just a, a, the earth is a dynamic planet all right, so remember we have two types of plate boundaries, convergent and divergent plate boundaries. At the divergent plate boundaries, like the Mid-Atlantic Rift, you have magma coming up from uh, the center of the Earth, producing new crust. As that new crust is created, it pushes, right, pushes the plate, all right, away from each other. You'll notice the arrows right here showing that. And then when the uh, oceanic crust runs into the, con the continental crust, the oceanic crust being less dense, subducts under the continental crust. Continental crust uh, uh, is, moves on top, and that's where you get uh, usually your mountain ranges and, and, and your volcanoes to form. Uh, think about in the Pacific uh, Northwest, the Cascades, uh, down into the Sierra Nevadas, which are in California. All right, you have the Pacific Plate going under the North American plate there uh, and, and producing uh, producing uh, those those uh, volcanoes and those mountains uh, along the west coast of the U.S. So uh, once again, uh, this is how it's done. So just kind of understand uh, these plate tectonics and how it works. Divergent plate boundaries create crust and at your uh, subduction zones, uh, that's when crust is destroyed and it's all recycled and over millions of years, you this is, uh, this is your cycle. All right, so... <clears throat> What are minerals and rocks? Well, mineral is a naturally occurring chemical element or compound that exists as a crystalline solid. A mineral resource is a concentration of minerals that we can extract and process into raw materials. And again, they are non-renewable. And a rock is a solid combination of one or more minerals. So basically, minerals are your building blocks to rocks. And then rocks, most of them, con uh, 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 most of them contain uh, more than one uh, more than one mineral. You could have a rock with a one mineral, uh, like, a, like a diamond, for instance, um, but most of them are going to contain more minerals, okay? So the mineral, kind of the base, uh, the foundation, uh, and then the rock uh, kind of built on with more minerals in it, and then a mineral resource is a concentration of minerals uh, that we can extract and that we can use. All right, remember our types of rock, sedimentary rock made from sediments, all right, dead plant animal remains, tiny particles of weathered and eroded rock. So remember, mainly forms in water. Uh, you have rivers that carry all these particles of, 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 weathered, of weathered rock and, 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 and material downstream. Eventually, that stream gets into a still body of water and it drops or deposits that sediment. All right, you have the bigger runs on the bottom, right? The smaller ones on top, and you have the sediment uh, that ends up piling up. And then over uh, over millions of years, lithification occurs, where you have the sediment uh, con con contracting, the fluid is expelled, and basically you then uh, get a rock, which is called sedimentary rock, usually in layers. Igneous rock, okay, forms under intense heat and pressure. All right, uh, so this is going to be your magma and your lava, things like that. All right, when when magma and lava cools, uh, you're going to get igneous rock. And metamorphic rock is any existing rock that is subjected to high temperature or pressure or fluids or a combination of those, uh, and then you actually change it to a completely different type of rock. So if you take a sedimentary rock and you put extreme pressure onto it, it changes into a different form, metamorphosizes uh, into a metamorphic rock, another type of rock. Same thing with temperature. You take some type of sedimentary or igneous rock and you put high temperature on to it, it ends up turning into another type of rock into a metamorphic rock. All right. Uh, and again, the rock cycle is that rocks are recycled over millions of years in this cycle. Erosion, melting, metaphor, uh, metamorphosism. All right. And this is the slowest of the Earth's cycle processes. And that's why mineral resources are non renewable because this takes forever, uh, pretty much, for the rock cycle to move. So uh, here is the rock cycle. Again, um, bringing back memories from earth science, I'm sure. All right, so what do we have? Let's say we just have an igneous rock or a metamorphic rock. It weathers, erosion, transportation of the sediment, deposit the sediment, and then you form sedimentary rock like sandstone or limestone. Then if you heat 
or put pressure or put stress on those rocks, they turn into something else, a metamorphic rock. Uh, so slate, marble, nice, quartzite. All right, these are all types of metamorphic rock, okay? Then if that metamorphic rock melts into molten rock or magma and then cools, you get some sort of igneous rock like granite or pumice or, 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 or basalt. Uh, then that igneous rock could go under heat pressure and, and turn back into a metamorphic rock or could be weathered and eventually turn back to a sedimentary rock, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so just understand this basically understand that all different rocks can turn into the other type of rock uh, depending on where they are in the cycle. So all of it is connected uh, and it takes millions of years to uh, go through it. Uh, and that's why our mineral resources are considered non-renewable uh, resources. All right, next thing we're going to start talking about is soil. All right. And soil is actually a renewable resource because you can make soil rather quickly. So physical, chemical, and biological processes all contribute to the formation of soil. Soil is a renewable resource and a key factor in nutrient cycling. All right, so how does soil form? Well, <clears throat> soil forms by the process of weathering that breaks up parent material that is the foundation of the soil. And usually that parent uh, material is some sort of bedrock. What is bedrock? It's the bed, kind of the bottom rock, all right? It's just rock. What happens is we have lichens and mosses that kind of form on these rocks. And if you've gone hiking at all, uh, or even just walking around Ardsley, you may have seen some of that green moss or green lichens on, on, on a rock. Uh, those, uh, those actually secrete an acid that breaks down the rock. And this is the first step in primary succession. So remember back uh, a couple of chapters ago, we talked about primary and secondary succession. Secondary succession starts with soil, okay? Primary succession just starts with bare rock, all right? And that first step is that these lichens and mosses attach themselves to the rock and they secrete an acid that begins to break the rock down. Okay. In addition, we have dead organic material that begins to accumulate, uh, releasing nutrients and holding moisture. And that is called your hummus. All right. Again, it's not hummus. Hummus is chickpeas mixed together that we all love. This is called hummus. Okay. It is that very dark, rich black soil that is full of dead organic material and that is very, very fertile. Okay, so again, these physical, chemical, and biological processes form the soil. So how does it happen? Well, first, we have what's known as immature soil, all right? Basically, just bedrock here. And we have now this moss and the lichens that uh, attach themselves to the rock and begin to disintegrate it with their acid, all right? So what happens is you get cracks in the rock. So then you have seeds blowing in the air that come in and land on those cracks in the bedrock and begin to grow grasses, and small shrubs. So this is your young soil. So what happens? As the, as the grasses and small shrubs uh, be, continue to grow and they die and then they grow, when they die, they become organic debris, which begins to uh, deteriorate and disintegrate. We got bacteria, right? Other things that have, that have come into the soil here that'll act to the, of that nutrient recycling. And we begin to get more in the way of soil. So then what happens is when you finally get to a mature soil, you basically have all these trees and all these uh, uh, organisms, bacteria and fungus and mites and larvae uh, in the soil. And that continues to create more in the way of soil. In addition, it creates more of that humus at the top level, which is your very fertile soil. That's where you want to grow your crops or your trees or your plants or whatever you want to do. Okay. And then eventually you get a mature soil that has these horizons, the O horizon, the A horizon, B horizon, and the C horizon. O horizon is just your leaf litter. All right, on the top of the ground. The A horizon is your topsoil. That's where your humus is located, the most, most fertile part of the soil. B horizon is what we call the subsoil, and that's when non-organic material kind of leaches down or leaks down from the topsoil into the subsoil. And then the C horizon is basically that bedrock, that parent material that started the process uh, at, at the beginning here. All right. So just understand how soil forms. And again, it is a renewable resource. I have a mulch pile in my backyard. Maybe some of you do as well. And whenever I blow my leaves or cut my grass or I have uh, ash in my fireplace, 
I dump it all on this mulch pile. And then every spring, I kind of dig into and dig down into the mulch pile. And I have beautiful humus, fresh soil that then I take out and I use in my garden or, or my plants on my deck. So I actually don't go out and buy a lot of soil. I may buy a little bit of potting soil, but a lot of it I use right from my mulch pile in my backyard. And again, you can create soil in about a year or two. It's actually a, a rather quick process. Uh, and some of you may be doing it. I know some uh, students I had previously uh, actually take their organic uh, garbage, like, like uh, banana peels and like apple cores and things like that, and put it in their backyard. And that stuff as well uh, will eventually uh, disintegrate and form uh, into that humus, into that soil uh, uh, that you could potentially use. So again, soil is a renewable resource. Uh, and in fact, you can make your own soil uh, if you would like. All right. So living organisms rely on soil. It's essential for agriculture, obviously. Uh, provides a medium for growing timber. Provides ecological services, such as purifying water and degrading waste. That's what soil does for us. And once again, you have those, uh, contains these soil horizons in the mature soils. So just kind of understand them. The O horizon is your leaf litter, just the kind of stuff on the top. Uh, a is your top soil, your A horizon. That's where your humus is located, very fertile. Uh, B is your subsoil soil and then C is your weathered parent material or that uh, initial bedrock uh, that started the process uh uh, at the first part of the soil of the soil making process okay uh, in addition what you need to understand is that the climate of an area is going to be uh, a huge factor in determining uh, the type of soil and the type of horizons you are going to get so for instance here you have desert soil in a hot dry climate OK, uh, you'll notice like here a, a weak humus mineral mixture. All right. In the in the A horizon, while we go to, let's say, a deciduous forest like here in uh, like here in Ardsley, humid kind of mild climate. And uh, here you have a humus mineral mixture that is uh, that is very rich. OK, uh, that is that is a. Uh, uh, that is very fertile. All right. So again, depending on your climate, here's grasslands, here's the tropical rainforest. Okay. Here's your coniferous forest, your pine forest. All right. So depending on the climate, uh, the climate will determine the type of soil uh, and the type of horizons uh, that you end up that you end up getting. All right. Uh, warm and wet environments are going to form soil faster. All right. That's why we can do it pretty quickly, uh, like in, in, in my backyard, in like a year or two, because it's a rather we're rather warm and we're rather wet here in Ardsley. Uh, in addition, tropical rainforest soils have little organic material in the soil and are nutrient poor. I want to stop and talk about this for a second. Um, many of you are probably saying that makes no sense. Uh, tropical rainforests have all this biodiversity, all these plants. How the heck can the soil be nutrient poor? Because believe it or not, all the nutrients in a tropical rainforest are locked up in the plants, in all the flora and fauna that you have in a tropical rainforest. That's where the nutrients are. They actually aren't in the soil, all right? They're actually in the plants, in the flowers, okay? And the reason I want to point this out is... Going back to something we discussed about how tropical rainforest contains most of, of the biodiversity on this planet. In addition, we've spoken about how people in developing countries have a right to support their families. So what's going on is you're having people in these tropical climates that are clear cutting tropical rainforest to plant crops. Okay. So you say to yourself, well, obviously it's not good to clear the tropical rainforest, but again, these people need a, a way to support their families uh, and a way to create food. The problem is the soil is terrible. So the problem is you have people who are cutting down these tropical rainforests, destroying biodiversity to plant crops, and the crops don't have a lot of yield because the soil is so nutrient poor. So this is where we need to increase our education. We need to go down into these developing countries and say, hey, wait a second. We understand that you want to, to plant and be able to support your, your families and have food. We get it. But your tropical uh, cutting down tropical rainforests, which A, are killing biodiversity, and B, not providing you with the plants and the agriculture and the food that you need because the nutrients, the soil is so poor. These people don't realize that. All right. People in developing countries uh, maybe do not realize that the, that the soil is so poor because they haven't been educated. All right. So something to think about. All right. Again, they're cutting down these rainforests to plant food. Look, again, I am one that says people should be able to support their families and have the same quality of life that you and I have. 
But this isn't working because you're cutting down tropical rainforest to plant crops in soil. That's terrible. All right. I think I'll get off my I'll get off my soapbox now. All right. Moving on. All right. So the import per, the importance of soil nutrients. All right. Again, most of those nutrients are in the A and the O horizons. All right. The leaf litter and that topsoil. OK. Fertile soil is going to produce high crop yields. Uh, within this topsoil and bacteria that convert nitrogen to ions that plants can assimilate. That's your nitrogen fixation, right, that we spoke about, all going to happen in those O and A horizons. The B and C horizons contain most of the soil's inorganic material, so not going to be as fertile. And soil texture is going to be determined by porosity and permeability. So here are some terms I'm sure that you uh, are <laughs> remembering back from earth science. Porosity is the amount of airspace in a sample of soil. Permeability is the ability of water, how easy water uh, it is for water to go through uh, a, a soil sample. So here we have it. All right. You'll notice high permeability and low permeability. And basically porosity and permeability are directly related. All right. The higher your porosity or the more pore space in between grains of soil, the higher the permeability, the easier it will be for water to go through that soil sample. Vice versa, if you have soil with low porosity, meaning not a lot of pore space or air space between the grains of soil, you're going to have low permeability or it's going to take a, a longer time for the water to get through that soil sample. So size, shape, and degree of clumping of soil particles determine... Oh, sorry about that, guys. Where were we here? All right. Sorry, a uh, size, shape, and degree of clumping of soil particles determine the number and volume of spaces for air and water within the soil. Water can more uh, flow more easily through soils with more spaces than through soils with fewer, fewer spaces. So again, uh, where you where you have larger di uh, larger diameter uh, soil grains, so for instance, sand, which is 0.05 to 2 millimeters in diameter, you're going to have more a higher porosity more pore or air space and therefore higher permeability, uh, the water will go through it quicker. Your, your, your smallest uh, size uh, soil, which is clay, 0 0.002 millimeters, all right, very uh, small grain size, you're not going to have a lot of porosity, you will, the porosity will be low uh, and therefore the permeability will also be low, meaning it'll take water a, a longer time to get through it. Okay, um, so again, just kind of understand, uh, understand these terms. So how long might supplies of non-renewable mineral resources last? So obviously that's our next question because we're talking about these non-renewable mineral resources, we'll move away from soil now. Uh, and the point is that they only exist in finite amounts. So uh, we have an issue where they can become what we call economically depleted. And what that means is when it costs more to pull the gold out of the ground than the gold is actually worth, uh, then there's no real reason to go get the res mineral resource anymore. And that is when we term it economically depleted, okay, or the reserves are to a point that they're not totally depleted, there's still some left, but they're economically depleted because uh, it, it costs more money to get the, the, the remaining reserves out, the remaining mineral resources out, than it would actually, uh, than it would actually, uh, how cost more to take out than it would be to sell it. So as a company, you're going to lose money. And so you just basically uh, abandon, uh, you end up abandoning that resource. So there are several ways that we can extend the supplies of mineral resources, all right? Methods limited, obviously, by economic and environmental factors. Um, so we depend on these uh, variety, though, of these non-renewable mineral resources. So, for instance, ore, what is ore? Contains profitable concentration of a mineral. Could be high-grade or low-grade ore. Okay, that's just how pure it is. High-grade, very pure. Low-grade, not as pure. All right, but again, a, a profitable concentration of a mineral. So, like iron ore, for instance. All right. We also have metallic mineral resources. All right, aluminum. All right, is a metallic mineral resource. Steel, which is actually a mixture of iron and some other elements. Copper, gold, okay, these are all uh, metallic mineral resources uh, that we use. Some non-metallic mineral resources out there uh, would be something like sand, gravel, limestone, phosphate. All right, these are minerals, uh, but they are non-metallic, all right? They're, they're, not, they're not made of metal. So, uh, again, reserves, they're identified deposits from which we can extract the mineral profitably at a current price. We call it, we call it reserves. 
Economic depletion occurs when the extraction costs more than the remaining deposits are worth. Usually that's about 80%. All right, so the depletion time, the time uh, to use a certain portion, usually 80% of the reserves at a given rate of use. So that's our depletion time. And again, usually when 80% of the reserves are gone, there's only 20% left, that's when it becomes what we call economically depleted, where we still have 20% of the reserves to come out, but it'll cost more money to take out that, uh, that remaining 20% than it would be to sell that 20%. And so we consider that reserve at that point depleted, uh, and then companies move on to try to find other reserves. So uh, again, um, we need to figure out how to kind of stop this. So uh, options that we can do when these resources become economically depleted, we can obviously recycle or reuse existing supplies. Uh, we can waste less, we can use less, we can find a substitute, which again, if you kind of listen to me over the past couple of months, you kind of know that my whole thing here is that as humans, we are very intelligent and we should be using our intelligence to come up with technologies that can help us save the, uh, save the environment. And this is one of those, finding a substitute for some of these mineral resources, some kind of artificial uh, 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 mineral resource that we can make as humans uh, that can uh, uh, then we can use instead of pulling this stuff out of the ground. Or maybe we can do without, you know, maybe you don't need that bling 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 around you uh, around your neck or on your ears or something like that uh, maybe we can we can do without so again these are just some options that we can uh, we can uh, uh, we can do we can use uh, when these uh, resources become economically depleted so this map uh, is just kind of showing what happens when you have uh, these depletion times? So when you have, here's production up the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So when your depletion time is really short, what you're doing is you're, 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 you're taking out a lot of production real quickly, but then what happens is we end up uh, kind of getting a, a quick depletion time and you end up seeing rising prices, no new discoveries, things like that. What you want to try to do is do more of a C curve where your production, you don't ramp it up so intensely right at the beginning, you kind of slowly ramp up your production uh, and, and this allows you to maybe recycle and, and reuse and, and reduce consumption, all right, uh, maybe improve mining technology for instance like that and you'll notice on the c curve the depletion time so much longer uh, than on the a curve so that's kind of things that we need to think about when we start uh when we do mine uh, a, a way to mine these 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 mineral resources again don't do it so quickly do it slowly recycle re uh, reuse what you have initially and then this can extend that depletion time uh into to a much longer time uh then you'll notice depletion of, of curve a all right so just kind of understand understand uh, uh, what that what that chart is kind of showing you all right so this next case study talks about uh, rare earth metals okay uh, there's actually 17 rare earth metals out there uh, they're important for several widely used technologies uh, but again they are they are Look at that word, rare earth metals, okay? There's not a lot of them out there, and so we need to really be careful uh, in, our, in our use of these metals and our extraction of, of these rare earth metals out of the ground. But some products that are main, uh, made, LCD flat screens, uh, compact fluorescent LED light bulbs, solar cells, fiber optic cables, batteries and motors for electric cars. So as our technology is, is, is improving and ramping up, uh, you'll notice all this stuff here, all these products uh, really within the last 20, 30 years, our need for these rare earth metals are obviously uh, increasing as well. So here are just some uh, of your rare earth metals. Um, uh, dis, uh, dysprosium, all right, for instance, is used to uh, make electric motors and generators in cars. Uh, cerium here uh, for batteries in cars, for a catalytic converters, okay? And you'll notice some of these other rare earth metals down here. Uh, I'm not going to try to butcher the uh, pronunciation of these. Uh, Neo didium, didium, didium here, okay, or prasio didium here, all right. Regardless, all of these are rare earth metals, and you'll notice the uh, the uh, products that that go into them. So uh, again, I would just kind of have a, a general understanding uh, of these, uh, and just understand that they're very important, uh, very important. These rare earth metals for a lot of our higher, uh, our our more modern uh, uh, tech. Tech technology that we're creating recently uh, uses these, these rare earth metals. All right, so market prices will affect the supplies of mineral resources, all right? Higher prices can do certain things for us. They can encourage the exploration for new deposits, 
Uh, they can stimulate development of better mining technologies because if the prices are too high, you're maybe you're, it's taken too much money to get the extract these minerals. So uh, maybe we can develop better mining technologies. So again, higher prices, it'll stimulate uh, the development of that. Uh, make profitable to mine lower grade ore. So again, we need better mining technologies to be able to pull out that lower grade ore. Uh, but if we can do that, then if we can make that profitable, uh, we can definitely uh, uh, help help with our supplies, promote conservation, obviously, higher prices can do. And this last one's kind of weird, but it kind of makes some sense. Higher prices also promote theft, right? Uh, if, if that gold is worth so much, it, it may it may promote thieves uh, to come in and steal that gold. Not exactly sure why they put that on the slide, uh, but Guess it, guess it, guess it makes some sense. Okay, uh, so these are some things that higher prices can do for us. So, what's happening though right now is we have subsidies, tax, tax breaks, uh, and import tariffs control the supply, demand, and price of key mineral resources. And as we've been doing in this country, we actually give mining companies subsidies uh, to. Uh, to pull more of these mineral resources out of the ground. Uh, so in essence, what we're, what we're doing is we're not making the price high. We're kind of bringing that price down a little bit so that these companies can make profits. Uh, but in a way, that's helping us quick, more quickly uh, uh, deplete our reserves of mineral resources. What we want to try to do is uh, make the higher prices so that we can explore for new deposits or, again, stimulate the better technologies or, or promote the conservation. Again, if prices are high, uh, these things uh, generally occur, and this could help us uh, in keeping our our. our uh, reserves. All right. So uh, that's pretty much what we're what we're talking about there. So can we expand reserves by mining that lower grade ore? That's that's a big question. So factors that limit the mining of lower grade ores. And again, lower grade just means it's not as pure as high grade. All right. You have increased costs in energy to mine and process the larger volumes of ore. Okay. Because it's not as as pure, you have to take more rock out and then you have to process it more to get the lower grade ore out. In addition, you need fresh water to do that as well. A lot of these mining techniques involve uh, uh, shooting fresh water uh, in high uh, uh uh, high force, high pressure uh, to help with this. And environmental impact of land disruption, okay? Uh, this is the problem with lower grade ore. You need so much more rock to come out to extract the lower grade ore because it's not as high quality as higher grade ore. Uh, so this leads to some problems. So again, if we can improve our mining technology, we might be able to pick up and get more of this lower grade ore. And something they're using right now, very interesting, only in the past 10 to 15 years, is something called biomining, which is basically using microorganisms like bacteria to extract the ore out of the rock. All right. So this is a great way to do it. It's just a very slow process. And obviously, as you know, uh, time is money. So uh, a slower process is not going to make companies as profitable. But that's something that we can do. All right. If we can figure out how to how to mine and how to expand the reserves of this lower grade ore, and maybe this bio mining is a way to do that, uh, then we can potentially uh, increase our reserves, expand our reserves that, uh, that, are, dis uh, uh, that are diminishing. Uh, because again, there's more of this uh, lower grade ore around. It's just harder to extract uh, and, 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 and harder to process. So we need to figure out out, again, using our minds uh, and using our technology, uh, how to do that. In addition, uh, we talk about can we get more minerals from the ocean? Uh, there are mineral resources dissolved in the ocean, but unfortunately, they are of low concentrations. So deposits of minerals and sediments along the shallow continental shelf and near shorelines could be profitable. All right, that's really close to the shore uh, that maybe we can go in and kind of mine the sediments, uh, you know, dig up the ocean floor uh, in those areas in the, in the shallow continental shelf near the shorelines. Uh, but again, they're trying to do this in the, in the middle of the ocean. Uh, is going to be uh, very costly and right now not uh, too costly uh, uh, that it's actually actually not worth it. All right. Uh, we have a uh, hydrothermal ore deposits. There are hot water vents again in the ocean floor uh, that will have some ore deposits. But again, getting down there tough. Uh, we have some manganese nodules. Uh, these are metals on the ocean floor, so they do exist. Uh, but again, tough to get to. And then obviously, what is the effect of mining on aquatic life? You can probably imagine that if you go down to the bottom of the ocean and start mining, uh, <laughs> it's not going to help the aquatic 
aquatic life down there. Uh, so obviously these are these are some issues that we think about uh, when we try to answer that question. Uh, can we get more? Uh, can we get more minerals from the ocean? And again, uh, here are just some uh, just some again some ways that we can try to get some of these crucial rare earth elements up from on the ocean floor. Uh, but again, right now, uh, it's really not cost effective. Uh, so right now, not really done a lot, uh, but maybe something you can come up with. Maybe if you go into this field, uh, you can invent some kind of great technology uh, that allows us to uh, get some of these mineral resources from the ocean's floor, uh, disrupting the uh, ecological services down there as little as possible, obviously. So that would be a uh, win-win for everyone uh, uh, if, it's, if it's possible. All right, so that's, uh, that's the end of part one, all right, of my uh, lecture on chapter 11. So come back for part two. I will see you then.